Hi, I'm Massimo Bartoletti and I will present a work entitled A Formal Model of Algorand Smart Contracts. This is a joint work with Andrea Bracciali and Christian Lepore from the University of Stirling, Aceste Scalas from the Technical University of Denmark and Roberto Zunino from the University of Trento. The subject of study of this work is Algorand, a new generation blockchain featuring an interesting consensus algorithm based on proof of stake, which has the very nice property of ensuring the absence of forks in the blockchain. Besides this, Algorand features a peculiar form of smart contracts. A problem with developing contracts in Algorand is that, even for the simplest form, the stateless contracts, the existing descriptions of their behavior are informal and incomplete. Actually, certain subtle features and corner cases are not properly specified in the official documentation, and to understand their behavior, one eventually has to resort to inspecting the source code. In the absence of a precise understanding of the behavior of Algorand, that is, in the absence of a formal model, it is impossible to prove that a smart contract is secure. Our main contribution is a simple, formal model of the mechanics of smart contracts in Algorand. By exploiting this model, we have been able to formalize a series of relevant smart contracts and to formally prove their security. To illustrate our contributions, I will first introduce the mechanism of transactions implemented by Algorand. Algorand is an account-based blockchain. This means that the state of the blockchain can be seen as a set of accounts, each one holding the units of one or more assets. Besides the native asset, called Algo, users can create custom assets. For instance, with this notation, I'm representing a user A with an account holding five units of Algo, while here I have a user B with an account which also holds two units of this user-defined asset called FooCoin. Transactions modify the state of the blockchain by performing actions on accounts. For instance, they can move assets from an account to another one, they can generate user-defined assets, and they can also perform some governance operations, like for instance, setting asset managers. This slide illustrates a state transition. We have an initial state where A has five algos, while B has five algos and two foo coins. Then B wants to perform this transaction. He wants to pay to A for algos. Then after the transition, in the final state, A has nine algos and B has one algo. So this is uh, quite uh, simple. But then uh, let's assume that uh, now B wants to transfer five algos to A. Is it possible? Intuitively, yes. Uh, and we would reach a state where A has 10 algos while B has zero algos. Right? No, that's not right. This uh, transaction fails because uh, Algorand imposes a constraint uh, on accounts. Since uh, in, the, in this account we have this foo coin, the balance of algos in this account cannot uh, become smaller than a certain threshold. So this transaction fails. Let's consider another case. Now B wants to pay one unit of foo coin to A. So I expect that uh, in the final state uh, A receives uh, one foo coin. Is this right? Actually, no. Why? Because uh, the recipient must opt in before receiving uh, user defined assets. So this transaction would fail. How can we so transfer one foo coin to A? First, A must fire another transaction to opt in for the foo coin. And after this transaction, the account of A 
has changed. Now there is space uh, for four coins, even uh, uh, though initially there are zero units of them. And in this state, uh, B can uh, transfer one full coin to A, uh, and uh, we end up in this final state uh, where A has one full coin. Now A has received one unit of full coin. Is she happy of that? No, because strange things can happen. A strange thing in particular is a, a clawback transaction. What does it mean? It means uh, basically that uh, B can steal uh, full coins from uh, the accounts of other participants, provided that B is the clawback manager of full coins. In this case, uh, with, through this transaction, B can uh, take back this full coin from uh, A's account and uh, add it to his own account. Besides the corner cases uh, we have seen in the previous slides, Algorand has uh, many, many other quirks uh, that overall make it difficult to precisely understand the behavior of transactions. For instance, there are constraints uh, on uh, accounts uh, and the assets that they contain. There are checks to prevent uh, double spending. There are temporal constraints uh, on when transactions can be appended to the blockchain. And in particular, there is a sophisticated uh, lease uh, mechanism uh, that allow to enforce mutual exclusion between transactions, which is quite difficult to understand. There are transactions that uh, allow to burn user-defined assets uh, or to delegate their management to other participants. And then there are even more complex features. For instance, uh, atomic groups of transactions uh, and uh, perhaps the most complex Complex uh, is uh, smart contracts. Overall, all these features uh, are uh, not quite easy to understand uh, from the Algorand documentation. Now, the focus of our work uh, is on uh, smart contracts, so uh, let me introduce them. Actually, in Algorand, uh, there exist two kinds of smart contracts, stateless and stateful and here the name uh, is uh, self-explaining. This work uh, is about uh, stateless contracts. To illustrate them, uh, uh, it is useful to compare their behavior with respect to the behavior of uh, the transactions uh, that we have seen so far. That is the transactions uh, involving uh, two user accounts. Here I have two accounts of A and B, and this transaction transfers one algo from the account of A to the account of B. And in order for this transaction to be appended to the blockchain, it must be authorized by a signature of A, that is, a signature of the sender. Now, besides user accounts, in Algorand there also exist contract accounts. The, the difference is that in a contract account, I do not have a, a participant as a key pair, but I have a script, a script that I'm calling E in this slide. And what is the difference? The goal of the transaction is still to transfer one algo from this account, the account of the sender, to the account of the receiver. The effect is the same. The difference is in the way this transaction is authorized. While when the sender is a user account, the authorization is a signature. If the sender is a contract account, then the authorization is just execute the script, and if the result is true, then the transaction is authorized. 
and uh, while executing the script uh, can inspect uh, all the fields of the transaction. To be more concrete, uh, let's assume that the script of the sender is the use one. This uh, script is written uh, in a bytecode language called TIL. So what is the purpose of, of the script? It performs three checks on the transaction. The first check is that uh, the type of the transaction must be a pay. Pay means uh, a transfer of uh, algos from uh, the sender to the receiver. The second check is that the amount transferred must be less than five units. The last check is that the receiver of uh, this amount must be B. So in this transaction here, I'm performing a pay, yes, this is okay, from the sender E, which is this script, to the receiver B, and also this one is okay, and I'm transferring uh, four algos, and this is okay. So the effect of this transaction uh, is to move uh, four algos uh, from uh, the account of E to the account of B. And since the script with this input evaluates to true, then this transaction is authorized. Instead, what happens if I try to append a transaction where I'm transferring seven algos? This time, the script evaluates to false because it violates this condition. And what happens if uh, I'm trying to append this other transaction where the receiver is C. Also in this case, uh, the transaction cannot be appended because uh, this clause of the script uh, fails. This seems uh, reasonable, uh, but uh, there are problems. What happens if I try to append these other transactions? Uh, there is uh, this strange field here, which is called uh, close remainder two. Here the transaction is saying, yes, transfer four algos from E to B, but then close the account of the sender and transfer everything to B. But if you look at, at the script, Still, even with this additional field, the script evaluates to true. So actually, this transaction can be performed and it leads to a state where B has 10 algos and the account of B has been closed. So, and this is somehow unexpected because if you look at the script, it just seems that uh, it allows any, any pay. It doesn't explicitly deal with this corner case. One of the lessons we have learned about smart contracts in permissioned blockchains is that bugs in a smart contract can cause direct losses of money. Now, all the discussion so far leads us to a conclusion. Writing bug-free contracts in Algorand is a complex task. This is because there are many concepts the programmer must be familiar with and many corner cases that may affect the security of a contract. Our approach to address this problem is to define a formal model of the Algorand smart contracts layer. A formal model can unambiguously define the behavior of transactions and contracts, covering also the corner cases. Further, it can be the basis to formally verify that the contract has no bugs and so it respects the intended functionality, also in the presence of adversaries. Summing up, a good formal model of algorithm contracts is something that allows you to save money. Now I summarize the main contributions of our paper. We have defined a formal model of the algorithm smart contract mechanism, encompassing both transactions and stateless contracts. We have inferred this formal model 
from the algorithm documentation, but in some cases the documentation alone uh, wasn't enough. And in these cases we had to uh, inspect the code of algorithm nodes and uh, eventually in some other cases we had to perform experiments to understand the actual behavior. We have validated our foreign model through a series of experiments. Then we have used the model to prove some fundamental properties of the algorithm state machine. For instance, that it doesn't allow double spending and also that it preserves the value of algos. Importantly, we have used our model to formalize a series of contracts ranging from oracles, lotteries, and in general, finite state machines. For some of these contracts, we have been able to formally prove their security. That is that they respect their intended behavior also in the presence of adversaries. Technically, our formal model is a label transition system. The states of this transition system are sets of accounts and the labels are transactions. Here, for instance, I start from this state where A has seven algos and B has three algos. And then with a transition labeled with this transaction, I generate some units of a user-defined token tau. This is the new state. And then within our model, we can define uh, all the uh, typical uh, types of transactions that are defined in Algorand. For instance, the opt-in that we have already seen that allows a user to accept a new asset, the pay to transfer assets from uh, an account to, to another account, and revoke to steal assets from another account. Besides the transaction types seen in the previous slide, our formal model encompasses all the transaction types implemented by Algorand. For instance, those to burn assets, to freeze or unfreeze assets, to delegate the management of assets to third parties and so on. Then the model uh, features uh, all the validity constraints on accounts uh, and all the temporal constraints uh, about when a transaction uh, can be appended to the blockchain. These temporal constraints uh, include, for instance, uh, the lease functionality. Then the model uh, includes more complex features like uh, the atomic groups of transactions and the stateless contracts. However, instead of modeling contracts uh, as scripts uh, in a bytecode language like NTIL, in our model we de describe contracts uh, in a simple declarative language, so they are easier to read. Then the model includes uh, authorizations for transactions in the form of signatures or witnesses uh, for the scripts. Now, I will not give further details about our model of transactions, rather I will spend the rest of the talk uh, to illustrate our model of stateless contracts. And uh, I will not give uh, all the needed technical details, but uh, I will illustrate them uh, with an example. The example is a contract which implements a sort of bet. A bet between two participants, say Alice and Bob, and they bet on the weather. There is an oracle which can say two messages, today it's raining or today it's sunny. And Alice wins the bet if the oracle says that today it's raining. And when Alice wins the bet, she can append a transaction to close the contract account and take all the coins held in the, in the contract. But to do so, she needs 
to uh, have uh, the message produced by the oracle and the signature on the message of the oracle to avoid forgeries. Instead, if the oracle says that today it's sunny, then Bob wins the bet. And uh, when this happens, Bob can append a transaction to close the contract and take for himself uh, all the coins held in the contract and uh, still uh, he needs to have the message and the signature of the oracle on the message. The contract has an additional feature to avoid uh, the case where the oracle just does nothing, he sleeps, uh, and the coins uh, remain frozen within the contract. And uh, uh, there is a sort of timeout uh, after a certain round. Alice can append a message, a transaction to close the contract and redeem uh, all the coins. What happens if the oracle says today is raining and Bob still tries to append a transaction to redeem all the coins from the contract? Then, in this case, this transaction cannot be appended to the blockchain. Here is how we specify the oracle contract in our declarative language. Let me explain how it works. First, the contract only accepts closed transactions that close the balance of Algos. So, since uh, the contract does not accept any opt-in transaction, this means that uh, it can only have a balance of algos. So this transaction here actually close the contract. Then uh, it, uh, uh, there is a disjunction between three clauses. In the first clause, the, this means that uh, the witness uh, passed to the script is zero. Zero represents today it's raining. In this case, we verify the signature on this argument and we verify that the signature has been produced by the oracle. And in this case, since Alice is the winner of the bet, the only possible recipient of the coins stored in the contract is Alice. The second clause is, is symmetrical. Arc0 equals to 1 models today it's sunny. And in this case, Bob is the winner, so the only difference is that here we impose that the recipient of the Algos is Bob. The third clause models the timeout. And in this case, uh, we are saying that uh, if uh, it uh, passes too much time, this R max uh, is uh, a round number, then uh, without providing any signature, we, Alice can uh, redeem the coins. So I formally specified my smart contract uh, how can I prove that it is secure? In general, this requires a few steps. First, I have to decide which are the relevant attack scenarios. And these scenarios depend on which participants are considered the, the honest ones. For instance, if I am Alice, I can say that I am an honest participant and uh, since I also trust the oracle, I also consider the oracle as an honest participant. But then, uh, since I'm Alice, uh, I do not trust uh, the other participant, Bob. So Bob, for me, is an adversary. Then, uh, for the honest participants, uh, we need to define uh, their strategies. What do they do in each uh, possible uh, situation? Then, according to these strategies, uh, we must establish 
which sequences of transactions can be appended to the blockchain. And this, of course, depends on the uh, formal model of transactions where, that we have defined. Finally, for each of these possible sequences of transaction, we must uh, see what is the state uh, that we reach after appending this transaction and we must uh, uh, ensure that uh, in this state uh, the honest participants have reached their goals. In our specific example, the Oracle contract, uh, let's assume that uh, I am Alice. So I'm considering Bob as an adversary. So I have to specify only the strategies of the Oracle uh, and of myself. About the Oracle, uh, all I need to say is that uh, it signs either 0 or 1, but uh, it doesn't sign both messages at the same time. Or there is another option, the oracle uh, can just uh, do nothing. Instead, my strategy is this one. If I see that the oracle signs zero, means uh, today it's raining, before the timeout, then uh, I append uh, this transaction to the blockchain. And this transaction says that uh, I want to close the Oracle bet contract uh, and transfer all the algos there to myself. And to be successful, uh, I need also to add uh, the witness uh, M, which is the message produced by the Oracle, and the signature of the Oracle on the message. Otherwise, if uh, I have not received this message, uh, after round uh, Rmax plus one, I send another transaction, still close the Oracle contract, uh, and send all the algos uh, to myself, uh, but this time uh, I do not need to provide the message and the signature. So, now that we have defined the strategies of the honest participant, we can uh, formally state the correctness uh, of the Oracle back contract. And this slide uh, contains uh, exactly the statement. The statement uh, starts uh, with an assumption. Assume that uh, we have a, a run, that is a sequence of transactions, that conforms to the strategies of myself, Alice, uh, and of the Oracle. And uh, I also require that uh, the run uh, is uh, long enough uh, to contain uh, relevant events for the contract. This means that uh, I require that the run uh, reaches a state uh, where the Oracle bet contract has been opened before the timeout. And also that uh, the run uh, has reached at least the round just after the timeout. Now that we have this long enough sequence of transactions, the theorem states that with overwhelming probability, it happens that if the oracle has not signed one, meaning to date sunny, within the timeout, this means that the winner is not Bob, then the run contains uh, this closed transaction which transfers all the algos to A. This means that uh, with this transaction we are sure that Alice has received at least n algos from the contract, where n is the value, is the amount of algos contained the contract uh, at a certain point. So we see that uh, also in this very very simple case of the Oracle backed contract, uh, precisely stating uh, the correctness of the contract uh, is not uh, a, a, an easy task. It requires uh, to define strategies, uh, to understand which runs are the relevant ones, 
and to formalize uh, what happens uh, in these runs. So imagine what happens for more complex contracts. Without having a formal model to reason about all the details, about all the things that happen in this situation, it becomes uh, almost impossible to really understand what happens uh, in uh, the possible contract ex executions. Besides the Oracle BET contract, we have used our model to formalize other relevant contracts. For instance, uh, we have formalized the ASH time locked contract, uh, which is the basis for more complex contracts like lotteries uh, and other gambling games. And we have also formalized uh, some DeFi contracts, uh, for instance, uh, escrow, periodic payments, uh, and so on. Remarkably, we have managed to find uh, a way to encode uh, arbitrary finite state machines as uh, stateless uh, contracts, which is uh, somehow surprising. To conclude, we have proposed a formal model of algorand transactions uh, and smart contracts uh, in their stateless form. Our model abstracts from uh, unnecessary low-level details but still it is precise enough to cover most of the features of Algorand transactions and stateless contracts. You can see our model as an alternative form of documentation with respect to the official one. In a few hours you can read the paper and have a clear idea of how contracts work in Algorand. Crucially, our model covers uh, all the corner cases that are not uh, precisely described uh, in the Algorand documentation. But uh, these corner cases are fundamental when studying the security of contracts, so it is good that uh, our model uh, includes them. As an ongoing work, uh, we are currently developing a tool to translate our model into the concrete algorand. In particular, the tool includes a compiler from the scripts in our declarative language to the concrete TIL scripts executed by algorand nodes. This tool in the future could be the basis for static analyzers that uh, automatically verify relevant properties of smart contracts. So thank you very much uh, for the attention.